I'm Rob LaCuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby, here with Julianne Robinson, Director of the Netflix phenomenon Bridgerton. Julie, first of all, I'd like to, I really would like to know how does it feel to be such a huge part of a show that has in many ways redefined period <laughs> drama for television? Gosh, um, that's quite a question. Uh, as I was explaining earlier, I've been in my house because of the pandemic. I don't tend to read reviews. And uh, so, I, but I was aware that something was happening when I started getting texts, emails, um, alerts from people. My mother's 80 year old friend, who's a nun, apparently loved the show. So I was aware that something was happening. Um, but it, I think it was slightly different uh, to if it hadn't been the, the pandemic year. And obviously I think the pandemic itself had a lot to do with the success of the show. Um, but that's a very nice thing to hear. Thank you. Yeah. I also think it's because it's gorgeous to look at. It has beautiful people on it. The acting is amazing. Your direction is fantastic. The sets are gorgeous and there's a lot of sex on it, but that's just me. <laughs> now, <you> know, <laughs> you know what though, seriously, like when you look at your credits, it's, you've got a long, impressive list of credits, including many, many comedies, including one of my faves, which I won't even mention now. But so I'm wondering then what's the main adjustment that you have to make? to direct a period drama, because period comes with a level of expectation from audiences yeah. accustomed to Jane Austen and Merchant Ivory. Talk us through that adjustment. Well, I tried to um, approach, I tried to approach everything I do in any pilots that I direct or anything really from the script. I come from a theater background. I've worked in new writing for a long time at the Royal Court in London. And I always just take the script first, what it's telling me. So I try to, I love period dramas, but I try to not think too much about the history, the BBC history and, um, and, and just how to make it most, especially itself. What was it telling me? Um, I wanted it to feel just, um, and, and also this is what Shondaland wanted it to feel unique. Um, not like uh, and not like your traditional period drama, but the thing that was my guiding principle was the characters. You know, the characters have got to sing out. Um, they can be colorful costumes, beautiful houses, lots of horses, um, but the characters have got to speak to each other and sing out within that context. And that's always my guiding principle as an actor, as a director. Yeah. You know, speaking of Shondaland, you've worked on quite a few of those productions, actually, which I noticed. Um, what do you most appreciate about working in that creative environment? They're very, uh, I, I love uh, directing specifically pilots for Shondaland because they are so supportive of their creative. Um, they, they basically make sure that you get what you need. <laughs> to do the job um, and they're very, you know, if, if I, I remember talking to them, it, this was a conversation that we had early on about using contemporary music and uh, they were just, they were so supportive. We used contemporary music very early on, even in rehearsals, because we didn't want the actors to feel like they were in a, a period, uh, a, a traditional period drama. Of course, all the actors were British. So we, you know, we went, uh, we, we just went the extra step to just make it feel fresh, even from the rehearsal period, even from the dance rehearsals. Um, when we were talking about etiquette, that's something that I think people can feel is a little bit put on or a little bit foreign to themselves, perhaps. Um, but we wanted to bring it bang up to date. So for example, uh, we did etiquette rehearsals and we wanted to translate what what those gestures meant to the actors now today. Um, for example, there's something called cutting, which is uh, when you enter a ballroom and maybe you make eye contact with somebody else in the ballroom who might be of a higher status to you. Uh, then if that person just looks away without looking at you, that's called being cut or cutting. And that's something that's so familiar to anybody who's been to a prom or a high school 
dance. They know what that feels like. And so I just wanted it to feel very immediate to, to the actors. Yeah, I think that it's stuff like that that we probably don't necessarily notice, especially the untrained eye when we're watching the show, but we're so immersed in it and it feels so authentic. But at the same time, as you mentioned, there are there are aspects of the show that are quite modern and maybe even slightly anachronistic, but they seem to work. Like, you know, when there's one particular uh, uh, musical sequence where I'm like, is that Maroon 5? And I had to, like, really think it through. <laughs> so I'm just wondering then um, what kind of research i mean you've talked about the preparation but what other things are you doing to make the show feel you know authentic because with the cadence and gait of how the characters move and speak around the set what other things are you doing to make it feel fresh but also make it feel authentic i think something that's often overlooked is the pace um with uh this type of dialogue it's traditionally played quite slowly um but we would push the actors to go at breakneck speed and also um, constant movement. So particularly with the Bridgerton family, we wanted it to feel as if they was, there was constant uh, energy and movement and l life to those characters. So you've got people, actors, speaking at twice the speed that they're used to speaking at. And it, it can be, you know, it's difficult to say to an actor, you know, that's great, but, you know, we want more energy. We want more pace behind it. Um, and that was kind of echoed in the camera work as well. Um, just when when I was kind of designing the show, I was thinking about it from, I, I storyboarded a lot of it uh, because uh, Regency London doesn't actually exist. I, I hate to tell you this. So <laughs> the, the square where they live, it doesn't exist. It exists as two houses, one in Bath. I'm doing the hand thing, sorry. One in Bath, <laughs> one in Bath and one in London. So we would shoot, we shot the houses, the reactions of the characters across uh, from each other. And then we shot drone shots and we created the Grosvenor Square in post. And that went for, for a, a lot more of it than you would imagine. There were huge green swathes of green screen um, and so a lot of work went on in post just to create a very, as if it's just been built, it's just been built. You know, these houses are yeah. new houses, Regency houses, and just to, again, I think that helps with the freshness. So you mentioned this earlier, actually, that you work on a number of pilots. And uh, and I imagine when I speak to TV directors and about working on pilots, um, I, I always, I'm always told that there's extra pressures, obviously, because you're world building. You're setting the scene for all the other directors who are going to come on the show, you know, for many seasons to come, hopefully. Can you talk us through the specific pressures of taking on a pilot and taking the reins? I think it's a really good question. It's something that um, isn't talked about a lot, actually. I uh, I always try to um, pull together influences uh, and make it super clear to the creatives involved what direction we're going in um, so that we're all marching in the same direction uh, for the show so that every department, as each department joins, each department can join weeks apart, but everybody knows what where we're going um it is it is it can be very stressful i think i've done 14 pilots now which is an insane number of pilots um and uh it there's a it's there's a magnifying glass on a pilot like there is on no other episode um because it is the selling tool to decide whether this the pilot's going to go to series or not so from the execs all the way through on there's you're getting constant messages all the time we don't like this location we want more color we want oh the lighting looks a bit dark we need to brighten up the lighting that actress i mean once i was on a bus literally on a bus on a freeway it was a, pi a pilot called girls on the bus I was on a bus on the freeway and the executives were in a smaller executive bus behind us with a bar in it. And I was getting, and I was trying to direct and I was getting phone calls from the executive saying, her performance is horrible, it's horrible. And so then I, um, I, I'm not gonna tell you who that was, 
I don't know what I was. But then they said, and then they said, uh, pull over the bus, pull over the bus. So I had to tell the bus driver to pull over. The executive got out of the bus behind, which had a wire, trans uh, which had a wireless transmission, and came around and was telling me how I needed to improve the performance of the actor. And then she went, got back in her bus, and we carried on shooting. It was. I, I don't know. It's there's a lot. It's there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of voices in the mix. Wow! I, it's more like doing a commercial. I've only ever done one commercial, but yeah, I think it, that's a really good analogy. And thank God there were no buses on Bridgerton because you know then we'd all I know. Be that would have been um, a nightmare. We would have had that, people on yeah. horseback behind. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you know, um, this. So the, the the last thing that I need to ask you about because if I don't, people will be very cranky. And I know you asked about it all the time, but you did episode six, so we really can't look away from all the sex on this show, and people really, really love it because they because of the way that it's done on the show. It's 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 not it's not really that gratuitous. It's it's just fun and it's you know interesting and lots of other adjectives. I'm just wondering. Um, what is the hardest thing about the most difficult, challenging part about all the groundwork that you need to establish to make everyone comfortable to get those scenes done right? I think that that's a really good question. Um, uh, I worked with an intimacy coordinator for the first time in my career, um, and that she describes herself, Lizzie Talbot, as a, uh, a stunt coordinator for sex scenes. And I think that that's a really good description. Um, in terms of the actors, I had two very game actors. <laughs> you know, they they once they felt safe, they were very um, keen to tell the story because ultimately each of those scenes had a separate role within the episode in terms of the journey of um, Daphne's sexuality or her sexual awakening and her understanding um, and so each each scene was part of the storytelling so we worked with the uh, with the, we discussed the scene we discussed the shape of the scene and then we would rehearse the scene and everybody knew in advance how much visually we would be seeing <laughs> um, we, we planned that out in advance how the clothes were going to come off um, what protection there was going to be put in place so that the actors didn't feel too vulnerable. And there's all kinds of protective um, things like pieces of yoga mat. Um, and there's all kinds of things wow. in there to make the actors feel safe. So that was that was it. It was it was really everybody knowing, look, this is okay. I can say stop if I want to. I feel safe, and and I think that that way you get a stronger performance in that context. Yeah, and it makes so much sense to have a stunt coordinator, so to speak, because it is a very physical thing that people are doing on screen, and it has to come off properly. So, I mean, well done on that, Julianne, and obviously nominated the DGA for the pilot. Um, so it's not just me saying it, it's, you know, your peers also think you did a great job. So thanks for joining us today. We'll bring you back shortly for our panel discussion. That's great. You're welcome. Thank you.